Theory live stream lecture. My name is Julian. Today I am joining you from Portland, Oregon, where I am uh, visiting for a couple of days. Hello everybody on YouTube over here and on Instagram to my left. If you're joining me for the very first time, this is a weekly open access lecture series that I started in my car about two and a half years ago during lockdown. Um, I used to work as an educator at the University of London and the University of Oxford Brookes. And when the pandemic forced my university to close, I decided to host these free lectures for everybody online. Now, when we started, it was just a handful of people, students who I knew in person, roughly 10 or so. And by now it has grown into an international and worldwide community of likewise thinkers, learners, lifelong students. And that makes me so happy. So please do drop a comment. Let me know where you're joining me from. I see Romania already. Hello. And I see the Philippines. Wonderful that you are here this morning. Argentina. Good morning, Argentina. It makes me so happy knowing that we're connected around the world. I see Chile, Greece, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the patrons and Instagram subscribers who allow me to keep hosting these lectures open access and free for everyone on the internet. That is my dream to take these concepts and ideas and to make them accessible without dumbing them down, to hopefully retain some of the complexity that makes them interesting in the first place. To that end, if you'd like to access some of my long form content, including my courses, I've recorded many lecture courses series over the past years, and my ebook, as well as edited transcripts and our community features like Discord, please consider becoming a patron. You can find all that and more on www.patreon.com forward slash Jenaline and Julian. Jenaline being my wonderful wife who edits the transcripts and who helps us on the back end with a lot of the community features. Um, and we also just celebrated our seventh wedding anniversary yesterday, so that was quite wonderful. Hence why Jenaline is in the, um, in the link, w, uh, which is www.patreon.com forward slash Jenaline and Julian. And uh, for those of you who know our community behind the scenes, you will know that Jenaline is a substantial part of this project going way back to the very beginning and I wouldn't be able to do it without her. So let me take this, this unusual aside to briefly say thank you to Jenaline and how much she means to me and hopefully to our community. Okay, on that note, today I actually wanted to um, investigate further the topic of love and use the idea of love in a Chestertonian sense to talk a little bit about the nature of the sublime. And this is going to be relatively accessible. I'm going to try to teach this, host this lecture in a way that is uh, understandable for beginners. But we're also going to touch upon some slightly more difficult subjects for more advanced learners. But feel absolutely free to join me. I'm going to be here for about 45 minutes. And hopefully this will be stimulating and enriching for you in a way that will allow you to reflect on your own life and perhaps also encourage you to do some reading and analysis of your own. So I want to start with a quote from G.K. Chesterton that I find really interesting and profound. G.K. Chesterton was a writer, a theologian, a philosopher, and he has a beautiful quote where he says, the nature of true love is to love the unlovable in the same way that true forgiveness is to forgive the unforgivable. Faith is to believe the unbelievable. And hope is to find hope where all else appears to be lost. And I find that to be such an incredibly rich and interesting quotation that I would like to spend some time analyzing it with you and reflecting on some of its deeper truths. Now, for those of you who enjoy Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, you will immediately notice that this quote is actually used in the Netflix adaptation of The Sandman, in which there is an epic battle that takes place between one of the, between the protagonist and uh, one of the antagonists in hell. And she throws all the forces of darkness in the world against him. And she says, you could not possibly resist 
what is the one thing that you could be to resist me? And his answer is, I am hope. And he ends up winning the battle because hope is this impossible, paradoxical, sublime entity. Hope is not to have evidence that things might turn out for the best. Hope instead is something which arises precisely when all appears to be hopeless. It's something that has, therefore, as its central principle, as its essence, a kind of empty space, a void. Hope isn't a list of things that make you hopeful. Hope is all that you have when all else appears to be lost. It's this retroactive emergence in an empty space or a void. Hence also why the character in Neil Gaiman's The Sandman ends up winning the contest by becoming hope, because hope is in a sense unbeatable. It emerges precisely when it is already beat. So that's something we're gonna explore here a little bit today, the sublime nature and the relationship between love, forgiveness, faith, and hope. I wanna start with love though, because I think it's a easy to misinterpret quotation from G.K. Chesterton. When Chesterton says that love is to love the unlovable, it might appear out of context that he's saying that we should love someone even if they're behaving in a way that appears unlovable. Like let's say you're in a relationship and your partner doesn't reciprocate or treats you poorly. This of course shouldn't be a reason to love them more. In fact, this would be a very damaging or toxic relationship if you think about it, that the worse they treat you, the more attracted to them you would become. Instead, what G.K. Chesterton is trying to point out here is that the essence of love is always some undefinable X, something that cannot be properly particularized or exemplified. That when we're talking about love, we're always talking about a certain impossibility. The very question, what is love, therefore, is a very dangerous one, because as soon as you try to come up with examples of what love is, you've already diluted it in some way. It's similar to how in some religions, you're not allowed to depict the Godhead, because to depict the Godhead is to already have a lesser version of the God, a false idol that you end up worshiping. And something similar happens with love. As soon as you try to explain what it is that you love about someone, you've already turned that essence of truth into a kind of false idol. It doesn't really reflect it. In fact, when you try to explain to someone why you love them, like you go to your friends and you try to explain why you love your partner, they may not get it. And that can often be a good thing because you see in them something that perhaps other people don't see. Now, to love the unlovable therefore means that you're not trying to find one particular feature that makes them lovable. In a sense, it means that you don't love someone for just their looks, just their, I don't know, their money, their status, their appearance. You don't just love them for their family or their house. In fact, if you love them for those things, while they might contribute to a relationship, it actually makes it, in a sense, less like love. To truly love someone is therefore to love some indescribable essence, something which is by its very nature unlovable. The way they make you feel, the way they make you smile, the way you feel like you are your truest self when you are with them. Those are not things that you can really put on a list, and yet they are the essence of what it means to be in love. I was watching an episode of the Kardashians yesterday on Hulu, in which Kim Kardashian has a list of features that she would like to have in a, part in a partner. And the list is lengthy. It includes things like, has things going on in his own life, is a good listener, etc. All the sort of admirable qualities that you might look for in a partner. And yet, fundamentally, the fact that she has such an elaborate list, rather than being evidence of finding the perfect man, is of course a way to forestall the need for a partner in her life. The list, rather than a list of demands, becomes a reflection of all that she has not yet found 
and a partner. And so interestingly enough, if she were to find a partner, it would be unlikely that this would be someone who simply ticks the boxes. Instead, it would be somebody who makes the list of requests seem unimportant. This is another one of those sublime retroactive features of love, that you can have a type, but to truly be in love is to find someone who becomes your type. In fact, they're a type unto themselves. And here again, we have what you might call the vanishing mediator of the list, which is you have a particular set of requirements of what you'd like to have in your life. And yet at the exact moment that you fall in love, the list seems unimportant to you. The list suddenly emerges in its true form, which is a transitory vehicle while you were waiting or expecting to find love. In the same way that a type, strictly speaking, means that you have an imaginary idea of who you think would be compatible with you, precisely because at that point, no one is compatible with you until you meet somebody who retroactively becomes your type. Already you can start seeing a kind of mechanism or a formula emerging that we related earlier back to hope, which is that love isn't something that you start out with. And the more boxes that are ticked, the more likely you are to find it. Instead, it emerges retroactively, precisely where there appeared to be a void. And as much as I hesitate to give advice, I really do think that the best way to find love is therefore to not go looking for it. That in some ways it comes to you when the time is right. Vice versa, that if you try to force it, you may end up finding yourself in a situation where you think that you have found someone who is your type, and yet nevertheless something appears to be missing. It's going to be a very painful experience when you find someone who is perfect on paper, but not really perfect for you. In fact, one of the confounding things of love is that the person who is perfect for you may precisely be someone who is not perfect for you on paper. That to love someone in theory is very different to love them in practice. That you will find once again that the person who is right for you may completely confound what you believe to be your type. And here we have again the same mechanism that occurs with hope. If hope is that which emerges when all appears to be lost, then I would also say that love appears when all love appears to be lost. That many of us walk around through life believing that we will never find someone, that we are somehow unlovable, or that we don't want to settle, that we don't want to simply be with someone because we can't be alone. Instead, when you're ready, which is to say when you enjoy, as Schopenhauer once said, your own company above the company of anyone else, once you have practiced what in contemporary terms is called self-love, which should be distinguished to my mind from the capitalist consumerist imperative to love yourself by purchasing things and you know being worth it. I think self-love is a much deeper feeling. It's about enjoying your own company and being relatively comfortable with yourself, with your own thoughts and your own body, relishing in the privilege of being able to read and write and think and listen to music and spend the entire day doing what you find to be important not being dependent on other people for your self-worth, that is what self-love is. Self-love isn't the type of car you drive or what you post on social media. In fact, often that can be a substitute for self-love. There's a great meme where Squidworth from, uh, from uh, SpongeBob is lying in bed, scrolling over his own feed on his phone and saying, this is some great content. There's a certain truth to this, unfortunately, which is that many of us feel more alive, more like we're able to love ourselves when we present a picture of ourselves to others that appears to be perfect. Everybody knows that the internet is a truth which tells a lie. Namely, it's the curated version, not of how you'd like others to see you, but of how you'd like to see yourself. Self-love, on the other hand, is not needing other people 
to approve of you, not needing other people to make you feel comfortable in your skin. And ironically, when you are comfortable in this way, you are ready to love and be loved by someone. In a slightly more toxic way, there's a great quote by the um, uh, poet Pushkin, who once said that the easiest way to seduce someone is to not try to seduce them at all, or to put it in a slightly more aggressive way, as he does. The easiest way to make a woman fall in love with you is to not love her. Now, of course, there's a certain Russian fatalism to this, right? Obviously, you shouldn't toy with people's emotions. But there's a central truth to it, which is that as soon as you don't appear needy, as soon as someone realizes that you don't need them to fill a gap in your life, that's exactly when they'll find you more attractive. After all, this is the problem with the so-called idea of the nice guy. Some people think that when women don't like a nice guy, they think, well, I'll leap in the opposite direction. I'll simply be a really bad guy. And of course, for some people, there's a certain attractive quality to the anti-hero, to the person who seems to flout all the reason and responsibility, who is a rebel without a cause, as it were. And yet, fundamentally, to my mind, the reason the nice guy is not attractive is not because he is nice, it's because he appears needy. It's because he appears to need the other person's approval to fill a void within himself. Hence, it's okay to be nice. It's okay to be kind. In fact, I would encourage it. It's okay to be empathetic and understanding and to have emotional intelligence, all of which are great and promising characteristics if you want to be in a happy relationship. But that doesn't mean to behave like the nice guy. The nice guy is, in fact, not looking out for the other person. They're simply trying to preserve their own self-interest. Hence why it's better, as Zizek once said, it's better to be interesting than to be nice. It's better to have opinions and to have a sense of self and who you are and what you find important. There's nothing more depressing than asking someone for their opinion on something and to realize that they have none. What's interesting is to know what someone is willing to die for, what they're willing to go all the way for, because then you realize that they might be willing to die for you. They might be willing to go all the way for you. And fundamentally what therefore happens is that you're ready to love and to be loved when in a sense you don't need it, when it's not the thing that preoccupies you entirely. And this is where the flip side of love has to be examined as being possibly let's say, disruptive or destructive. It's also why Slavoj Žižek, building upon the French philosopher Alain Badieu, argues that love is violent. Love is violent in the sense that it disrupts your peace, your peace of mind. Imagine that you've become completely self-sufficient and happy. It's a paradox that at this point, you are, in a sense, ready to be with someone. Why do you fall in love at the exact point where you feel like you could be perfectly fine without it? It's kind of devastating if you think about it. And yet fundamentally, this is where love functions like hope. If hope is that which emerges where all hope appears to be lost, love often emerges, emerges precisely where love is seemed to be no longer needed. That at the exact point that you think that you can coast through life without needing someone, you are paradoxically, ironically, in the exact position to be in a happy relationship. Now, of course, within a relationship, you also have to learn to practice solitude. You can't simply be together all the time, although you might, you might enjoy being alone together, as it were. <clears throat> and even though it's slightly taken out of context, this is where I always find Rilke's quote, about love to be quite true, which is that love is that you become the guardians of each other's solitude. That when you are in love, you have not only found another you, you have found somebody whose headspace you have to protect and who vice versa protects that of yours. 
that one of the funny things about love is that it often brings with it an ethical commitment to some higher cause, some work, some projects, something that you would like to achieve that you are able to do thus the more because you are with your partner. In fact, one of the things that happens, I think, in a happy relationship is that you have what Brecht once called the third thing, or die dritte Sache, which means a shared cause, a joint commitment, a dream that you share that you would like to make come true. And it's funny because I think when people first fall in love, they sometimes think that their partner is a distraction from their goals. And then you realize that in a true partnership, which I hesitate to call a power couple because I find it sounds a little bit corporate, but in a true partnership, you are thus the more powerful. You are stronger together. You share and align your goals and your desires. That you're able to build something and do something and commit yourself to something that you might not otherwise have been able of doing. It's also why when you go back to the ancient Greeks, you realize that one of the key characteristics of love, which I think today we've forgotten, is that love is to teach somebody something. That a sign of love is to pass on knowledge to give them something. It's like, think about the person who taught you to drive. Often this is someone in your family, someone who loves you enough to willingly be unsafe with you while they learn how to navigate the roads and take the wheel. And that this is something that happens as you grow in a relationship. Think about the things you have taught each other, things you've had to learn, things you've been able to pass on. I find that to be immensely important. If anything, I would say that as much as I don't necessarily believe in the idea of love languages, I think that my love language would be education. That doesn't mean to mansplain to others how you'd like them to act, it's precisely the opposite. It's to be open to learn from them. That when you find someone you love, you respect them enough and you admire them enough, you take their views seriously enough, that when they say something, you listen and you wanna learn from them. And there's something beautiful about trusting someone in that way, That when they have something to say that you really want to listen. And to go back to Rilke's quote about being the guardians of each other's solitude, this means that not only do you feel alone together so that you can commit yourself to what you want to do, but you feel specifically that the thing that you are trying to do is something that can only be done together. Whether it's having conversations, whether it's cooking food together, whether it's going for a long walk together, that your incentive structures change because you are with that other person. Now, let's go back to the quote from Chesterton. Chesterton likens, therefore, love to hope. He says, true love is to love the unlovable, that undefinable X. There's a anecdote from Slavoj Žižek about this, where Slavoj Žižek says, um, uh, he talks about his own love life, and he talks about being with a woman. And at a certain point, the woman comes to him and she says, you know, I really think that I would be more beautiful if I lost, whatever, 10 pounds. And at that point, Zizek says that he looks at her and he says, of all the things you could do, please don't lose 10 pounds. Now, why does he say that? Why does he tell someone not to lose weight? Obviously, losing weight seems to be like a healthy thing, part of self-care. And yet what he's trying to say is that if the woman believes that there is something she needs to do in order to be attractive, then she'll never be able to find that thing. There's no one point, one weight at which that voice in your head goes away. Instead, love isn't about how much you weigh or how much you earn. It is that undefinable X, something which you might even risk losing if you become too obsessed with being perfect. It's a cliche, but Love is to find perfection within the other person's imperfections. And therefore we're back at G.K. Chesterton. Love is loving the unlovable. Which isn't to say that it is to love unattractive features per se, or when someone treats you badly to be attracted to them. To love the unlovable means that love is this undefinable X, this sublime essence that has as its content the, lack, the fact that it lacks any kind of formal structure. It cannot be properly defined. As much as I'm a little bit hesitant to endorse, for example, Haruki Murakami's sexual politics in his writing, I actually think that one of his obsessions in his novels, you know, whether it's Kafka on the Shore or Dance, 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 
is that for him, love is always about little features, little almost neurotic obsessions that characters have with the other. It could be an earlobe. It could be the curve of their nose. Sometimes it's a smile. He's very attentive to the way in which we have erotic fixation, not on the obvious elements, but instead on these little things that seem slightly out of joint. And I believe that one of the reasons why people sometimes feel uncomfortable with Murakami's sexual descriptions isn't necessarily because they seem exploitative, but it's because he puts his finger on this uncanny element of sexual and romantic attraction. That often it is a male gaze that is being written about, observing a woman in great detail with little things arousing him that she may not be aware of. And that is what often feels a little bit gross to me, not so much the awkward sex, of which there are many examples in literature. And yet this kind of fascination, this attraction with let's say, minimal qualities. Someone's smile, the curve of their neck, an earlobe, points towards this essence of love, this undefinable thing. In fact, I think that many people don't fundamentally realize that which is most lovable about them. It's one of the curses of subjectivity to be trapped in your own perspective, is that not only can we not understand how other people see us, which means that we're immensely preoccupied with it, hence Sartre's hell is other people. Namely, we only understand our own subjectivity by means of uh, projecting it onto the gaze of the other. We dress for the gaze of the other. We speak for the gaze of the other. We are trapped in communication, or as Hegel once said, we are doomed as soon as we open our mouth. Lacan's version of this is that language is a prison that we live in. We live in the other which means that we understand ourselves through the other. But it's precisely the things that we fail to see, that you don't always notice, that are probably the most meaningful. If you're in a relationship and you were to ask your partner what it is that they like about you, they're probably not going to mention the thing that you think is your best feature. It's always going to be something else, something that you might not even be able to see. There's a great line about this in the Netflix series, The Crown, I believe it's season three, in which Helen Bonham Carter, uh, who plays, I believe, Princess Margaret, is flirting with a young man. And she says, your hands are so beautiful. He's a gardener. And he looks at his hands and he says, I just thought they were in ordinary hands. And then she says, and she's of course still flirting with him, she says, that's what I find most attractive in a man, that he doesn't know his own best features. And there's a certain truth to that, which is that you don't know your best features. You might think you know your best features, but those aren't gonna be the best feature that attracts somebody else. Hence also why it's so important to be comfortable with yourself because you fundamentally can't control everything. A lot of discomfort about our bodies and about ourselves has to do with the lack of control, that we do everything we can to control our surroundings and our appearance, but fundamentally we realize that we can't control how others perceive us. Hence again, the classic truism that you have to let go of what other people think of you, which to my mind is a fantasy. I don't think that we can fully let go of it without losing a sense of our own self but perhaps I'm a pessimist. This also means vice versa that, um, and perhaps this is comforting, that your worst features are also unbeknownst to you. That a lot of us feel like there's something that we have in our appearance that we feel subconscious, self-conscious about. It could be that you don't like your legs, you don't like your hips, you don't like your chest, you don't like your lips, you don't like your chin. Um, I, uh, I've always envied people who have very, like, very angular faces. Like, if I put on any weight whatsoever, I immediately develop a very thick double chin. But the funny thing is that nobody else seems to care about that. Like, what you think are your worst features 
probably don't even register to other people. It's totally in your own head. And so in the same way that you don't understand your best features, you also really don't understand your worst features. In fact, if you take a picture of yourself, you're gonna notice that two things happen. One, other people might think it's a great picture, even though you think it's a terrible picture. Like you really think it's a bad picture, but your partner thinks it's so cute, they wanna have it up on the wall. Whereas a picture that you think is great, they might think is not good. Secondly, if you take a picture of yourself or if someone takes a picture of you and you think it's a terrible picture, try putting it in a drawer for a year or two and then look at it again. And you'll be amazed how different you look to yourself because it's very difficult to love ourselves in the present. And it's super easy to idealize ourselves in the past. And it's so painful because you think, you look at a picture of yourself when you were a child or even two years ago, and you think to yourself, if I could have realized back then just how fine I was, how okay I was, I would have been so much more relaxed. I would have been so much happier. And I think this is also the root cause of sentimentality and melancholy and nostalgia, which is that we're fundamentally primed to think that things used to be better, which also means that we think that we used to be better. And that can be a very painful experience. In fact, the definition of melancholy, going back to like 19th century psychoanalysis, melancholy is simply to fall in love with your own pain or to turn lost into its own object, to put it more technically. Let's say that you go through a relationship and you break up or they break up with you. Instead of doing the right thing, which would be to move on and to find someone new eventually, you hold on to your pain because it's the only thing you have left. After all, to lose your pain would be to feel like you're betraying that which you had. And so you become stuck in a paralysis, a cycle, where you've fallen in love with your own pain. And that's also what nostalgia is. Nostalgia isn't falling in love with your own pain. It's falling in love with your own past. That's the same kind of circular orientation that occurs with nostalgia, which is also why nostalgia and sentimentality is a key part of melancholy, which is that when you fall in love with your past, it means you're falling in love with your pain, namely the pain of loss. You've turned loss into its own object. And now you can understand, in a sense, all nostalgia products, be it movies or toys or video games, it's loss as its own object. That which you've lost appears to you as retroactively more important and more precious. And of course, that which you lose constantly by means of being alive is time. Time is constantly flowing through your fingers and thereby appearing to you to be more precious. Ironically, it should be the other way around. You should think that the time that is yet to come is more precious because it is yet to be lost, and yet our brains don't work that way. We idealize that which we no longer have. It's also why G.K. Chesterton, in an addendum on love, says that the easiest way to love something is to realize that it may be lost. The easiest way to love your future is to realize that it may be lost. The easiest way to have love for anything is therefore to pay attention to what it is to pay attention to its value. And even from a Christian sensibility, this is fundamentally what grace is. Grace is a willingness to accept the transitory nature of things and therefore to imbue that which you have and those who would, with which you commune with the importance that is their due, to value people, to practice gratitude. That is fundamentally what grace is. And it's funny because a lot of us think about living in the moment and living in the present and all those things, which again, in the same way that we would like to let go of others in order to be ourselves, and I find this to be a fantasy, in the same way that living in the present is fundamentally a fantasy. The more time you think about living in the present, the less you are in the present, as it were. It's the neurotic fixation that we have on stopping time, that as soon as you begin your life, and as soon as you become cognizant of your own finitude, you therefore have already started to live with a kind of sword hanging above your neck. This is also how you should understand Plato's idea that philosophy is about learning how to die. 
it's not preparing yourself for death. It's not saying, here are all the things I would like to do to be immortalized, because no one knows if they'll be remembered. In fact, one way to rob yourself of a rich life is precisely to not live it in the hopes that you will do something that will make you appear immortal in retrospect. Instead, when Plato says that life is learning how to die, and philosophy, therefore, is contemplating how to die, what he means is that there's a paradox to life itself, which is that we don't inhabit life directly. We have inhabit life through a symbolic death. When you're painting, you're gone. When you're reading, you're gone. When you're loving, you're gone. Whenever you're doing something that transcends it might appear like you're gone, but you're also most present. You're most there. And it's funny, sometimes when I travel, I notice that the things I remember most aren't all the amazing things. It's not the concerts and the experiences and going to monuments. What I remember most are the days where I decided to stay home and read a book and reflect and rest to let it all set in. And I think that this is fundamentally what happens in life, is that you have to practice a Kierkegaardian leap of faith into the unknown and challenge yourself and be curious and be willing to be surprised. But then you also need to let it set in. You need to find some grounding, some neutral foundation. And this is also, I think, fundamentally what Plato has in mind, therefore, when he says that to live is to live or to practice philosophy is to be in preparation for death. It's not to put your things in order. It's to embrace your finitude. It's, if you will, the absurdism that is implicit in all philosophy, which is this reversal by which immortality is not that which lies beyond finitude. Immortality is that which defies finitude. You feel immortal on the days in which you did something simply for the sake of doing it, that there is more immortality in a meal that is enjoyed once or a walk that is enjoyed in nature or something that you do for someone else, that there is more immortality in that than there is in writing your great novel or trying to do the thing that will make you remembered forever. And so we're back at this paradox of love and hope. If hope is that which emerges where all hope appears to be lost, and love is that which emerges where all love appears to be lost, in other words, you don't need it, in the same way to immortality is that which emerges when you leap into the finite, when you embrace the pointless, as it were. And if I were to have a mantra for life, which I don't, but if I did, it would be, Embrace pointless things. You'll be surprised how much meaning you can find in seemingly pointless things. In fact, be wary of things that appeal that appeal uh, that appear to be too purposeful. Be wary of grand projects and narratives and schemes that tell you that you will fill your life with purpose and meaning. Instead, find meaning in the littlest of things and the pointless things. Embrace pointless things, do pointless things. When I was young, one of the things I enjoyed doing was skateboarding. Skateboarding is supremely pointless. And yet on the days that I skateboarded, I felt like I'd lived forever. And so doing pointless things is of course related to love because when you're in love, you really do a lot of pointless things. Going for a walk is wonderful, sharing a meal together is wonderful. Building a home together is wonderful. Suddenly your previous incentive structures about what you thought gave your life meaning don't seem quite as important. It's like the beautiful line from, um, uh, I think it's uh, Borges, who wrote that when he's separated from his loved one, it's like time has stopped. That there are two ways of telling time, as he puts it, when they're there and when they're not there. And that's what happens with love, is that when you're with the person you feel like you need to be with, it doesn't matter what you do. You don't have to go out. 
You enjoy each other's company. You relish in each other's conversation. And everything that appeared to you as pointless before suddenly becomes profoundly meaningful. And so embrace pointless things. I, I, again, I hesitate to come up with a mantra, but to me, that's one. Pointlessness is actually quite purposeful, if you will. Now that we've investigated love and hope <clears throat> and eternity, let us briefly return our attention to the remaining aspects of Chesterton's quote. And for those of you who are just joining this video, let me repeat the quote. The quote is, true love is loving the unlovable in the same way that true forgiveness is forgiving the unforgivable. Faith is believing in the unbelievable and hope is hope where all else appears to be lost. Now here I want to briefly juxtapose forgiveness with tolerance. Tolerance is one of the primary quote-unquote liberal secular virtues that we should live in a tolerant society where we respect the other's dignity, which often means that we respect that the other person doesn't want to be harassed or offended, that we don't do things to offend people or harass them or make them feel otherwise uncomfortable. And yet, from a Chestertonian perspective, tolerance is deeply suspicious and forgiveness is deeply emancipatory or liberating. Now, what makes tolerance suspicious? Well, for Chesterton, tolerance always implies a power imbalance. Namely, who gets to tolerate whom? What is the unspoken norm that someone's actions are supposed to deviate from? Think about it. Let's say that you, are, uh, you live in a heteronormative society, as we do, but you've decided that you will tolerate people who are queer. It seems incredibly dismissive and pedantic to put it in those terms. Because it suggests, therefore, that there is one right way of living and that there is one deviation from it that therefore has to somehow be accepted as a almost a mild, you know, you know, as, a, as an inconvenience. Tolerance, therefore, always implies that the person who tolerates is implicitly the person who is more powerful, more representative, somehow more, uh, more equal. This is Orwell's famous line that everyone is equal, but some are more equal than others. And this is exactly what tolerance implies, that it preaches the virtue of equality, whilst fundamentally saying that some are more equal than others, and therefore defends a system in which some people's rights are guaranteed above and beyond others. Forgiveness, on the other hand, and this is also where I should note that, of course, Chesterton is a Christian author and theologian, Forgiveness isn't saying, I have a list of things that I find to be forgivable and unforgivable. Instead, forgiveness, true forgiveness, emerges precisely when you feel like you cannot forgive. It's also why forgiveness is so radical and revolutionary. I think that of all the virtues, forgiveness is the hardest. Because it's easy to say that you're going to forgive, but if real forgiveness is forgiving the unforgivable, then when push comes to shove, it's incredibly hard. It's not something I'm sure I'm always able to do. But again, we're at the sublime quality of forgiveness. In the same way that hope emerges where all hope appears to be lost. In other words, you don't start with hope and then it diminishes. It's the other way around. It retroactively emerges at the end. Forgiveness isn't something that you start with out of the goodness of your heart. It's something that you arrive at precisely when you feel like you will never be able to forgive. True forgiveness, therefore, emerges in what appears to be a void of forgiveness. It's also what true kindness is. It's easier to be kind when life is going well for you and when people are treating you well. It is much harder to be kind and to take the high road when you're on the receiving end of other people's unkindness. But fundamentally, that's what kindness is. It's not to have a list of expectations about how you'd like to be treated. It's about saying, I will treat you with kindness no matter how you treat me. 
Again, it emerges retroactively, apparently where it appears not to be. Now, I've mentioned the word sublime here a couple of times before, so it might make sense to briefly emphasize what I mean. I'm talking here of the Kantian sublime. The Kantian sublime, in, 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 in contrast to the romantic Burkean sublime, which I can explain in a moment, the Kantian sublime is that which has as its own central characteristic the fact that it has no formal content. It's a very technical, philosophical way of describing it, but fundamentally, this is the sublime entity of hope and love and forgiveness. It's not that you start with love. It's that love emerges when you think you don't need it, when you don't have it. Hope emerges precisely when you think that all hope has been lost. Forgiveness is not to forgive or tolerate that which is acceptable to you. True forgiveness is to accept the unacceptable and therefore retroactively to render it in its opposite form. And this leads us finally to Chesterton's argument about the sublime nature of faith, of belief. We just say that faith is faith not because it finds evidence of the object of its belief. Faith is faith precisely because there is no evidence. In the same way that trust, for example, isn't to say, I trust you because I know what you will do. It's to say, I trust you because I've seen what you have already done. And faith, therefore, is actually not the preoccupation with finding evidence for the existence of God or some deity. Faith is precisely to believe in the unbelievable. In fact, hypothetically, if a godlike figure were to emerge and to declare themselves as the Messiah, it's less likely you would believe in them. And so faith is the practice of a certain kind of futility and finding grace in that futility. Chesterton writes about the fact that when you pray, for example, and I think this makes sense even to people who aren't religious. If you pray, you're not directly sending a message to someone. Perhaps, but it's unlikely. Instead, the very act of prayer, especially prayer which is reflected and mirrored by others, therefore generates its own message. In Lacanian terms, it is the message that arrives even if it fails to be received by the recipient. That the medium is the message, to put it in McLuhan's terms. That prayer is its own message. Therefore, it's not the content of the message that is being transferred. It is the content within the form of that which is being sent in the first place. Namely, the content in the form of prayer is faith. Therefore, prayer is not that which is sent, like some email service between you and God. Prayer is itself the act of faith. And so belief or faith is not that which requires evidence of the object to which it is being sent to, the recipient. Instead, it is its own content. The futility of faith is therefore precisely that it is that which is filled in retroactively. It is not the belief in something, it is the belief despite nothing. And here again, we have a kind of implicit absurdism that emerges in this formula that Chesterton has. Hope appears where there appears to be no hope. Love appears where there appears to be no love. Forgiveness appears where there appears to be no forgiveness. And finally, faith appears where there appears to be no God. And many people, I think, when confronted with evil in the world, find themselves thinking, how can there be a God if he allows, for example, children to suffer, if he allows cruelty to exist? And yet, for some Christians, the answer is, it's precisely because God is absent that he is here. This is what you might call, and what a lot of theologians call, the dialectic of presence and absence, that God is present in his absence in the same way that hope emerges when all hope has been lost, in the same way that love emerges when love's particular features no longer seem to matter, and in the same way that true forgiveness emerges when you find that you have found the unforgivable. And this is the sublime nature 
the mechanism of the sublime that exists within love, faith, forgiveness, and finally hope. Now, I want to end briefly by giving you what I had promised, which is to briefly explain the difference between the Kantian sublime and the Burkean sublime. The Burkean romantic notion of the sublime is that it is a trickle-down quality. When you see something beautiful, like a beautiful person, or a ruin, or a beautiful reflection of light on the water, you say to yourself, here is a reflection of the divine. And yet the Burkean idea of the divine remains stuck in a transcendental hierarchy by which the perfect exists in the godly beyond the heavens, and the imperfect is that which exists here on earth. Therefore, whenever we find beauty in the world, we see, if you will, an impure reflection of divine beauty. This is the romantic ideal of the Burkean sublime. The Kantian sublime, however, reflects the Kantian revolution in philosophy, which radically upends this transcendental hierarchy of the perfect existing in the beyond and the lower existing in the world. Kant's sublime suggests that what is sublime isn't that which is an impure reflection of the divine. What is sublime is that which is an impossible reflection of its own content. Or to put that a little bit more simply, the sublime is always that which has the paradoxical nature of emerging retroactively or too late. It's a kind of excessive plus one. On an ontological level, you could say that here we have the ontology that would then be completed in Hegel, the ontology which Zizek calls less than nothing. And those are the examples that Chesterton has. Love is sublime because it emerges where it appears that there is no love. Hope is sublime because it emerges where it appears that there is no hope. Forgiveness is sublime because it appears when it appears that there is no forgiveness. And faith is sublime because it appears when there is nothing that proves its existence. Now, what's important here, and I really cannot stress this enough, especially if you're interested in philosophy, is that rather than being mere examples, this is actually an ontological argument that has radical consequences. If the romantic ideal is that the perfect or the divine exists up above in the heavens and that we are lowly fallen creatures that have to be reunited with it, then the idea of the sublime actually liberates us from this, from this impossible demand of ascending to the heavens as poor lowly souls. The sublime instead says that the essence of the heavens, the essence of the pure, the sublime form, emerges only through its apparent fall into its opposite. That therefore the fall is what retroactively generates that from which it appears to have fallen, which is a completely different ontological proposition. No longer perfect in the sky and what falls from it is a mere reflection, but perfect emerging in the fall from where there was nothing save for its own fall. It's a hugely consequential ontological transition, one which averts the very logic or formula of the hierarchy of existence, going back to Plato and Plato's allegory of the cave. As we will see next week, this is why Hegel is a Christian thinker, because Hegel takes the fundamental message, if you will, the or not message, the fundamental, um, because as Oscar Wilde once said, you know, uh, uh, art and, and literature never contains a message. And the same way philosophy doesn't contain a message. Anyway, that's an aside. In the same way that Hegel takes the Christian logic of the New Testament, which is that what dies on the cross is the God of the beyond, not Christ, namely that what dies is the transcendental hierarchy of the sublime and the transposition of the sublime back into the fallen. In the exact same way, Hegel makes an ontological argument about the nature of essence or truth, that it is not that which lies beyond the transcendental horizon. It is that lies within the so-called unity of opposites of that which appears to be unreconcilable. 
That's very technical, but we can talk more about that next week. For now, what I'd like to leave you with is Chesterton's quote about the nature of love and how he relates love to forgiveness, to faith, to hope, as examples of the sublime through which we can access some ontological arguments about the nature of divinity and about what is essentially, let us not forget, the objective of all philosophy, which is the inquiry into truth or pure form. Thank you so much for watching today. I really appreciate you. If you'd like to support these lectures and help me keep making them, if you'd like to access my courses and my ebook, please consider becoming a patron. It makes a huge difference. Uh, I'll put the link in my description. Or you can make a small donation to Instagram by becoming an Instagram subscriber. It's just $5, but again, it makes a big difference. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. And for all of our patrons and subscribers, I will be joining Discord in a couple of minutes for a Q&A session that we're going to record afterwards. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you so much for being part of our learning community. It has been such a pleasure to start my week with you. I hope that you've enjoyed this. Thank you so much.